Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Seeker Plus again today. I am Trace. This is episode three of three in our series on sex. So far, we've talked about the molecular biology, the neurology inside of the brain, what's going on when you're turned on, when you're orgasming, all of that. If you haven't listened or watched that, go back and do that first before you watch this one. And this is, again, episode three, so make sure you subscribe for the next series and all of the other series of Seeker Plus. You can also find us over on SoundCloud and iTunes. The audio podcast of these episodes should be out today. Go and find it. Today we're going to talk, though, about teledildonics, going in a little different direction. It's related, though, I promise. We're also going to talk about sex bots, technologies that might change the nature of sex and sex work. But first, I've said this every week, and we're in the third week, so it might seem a little, you know, trite, but this episode does acknowledge that sex exists. This one's a little more racy than the other two episodes that were more about molecules and chemicals. So if you're with kids or something, maybe think twice before you watch this one. Anyway. Let's kick into it. So everyone looks into the past when it comes to sex. Oh, the Victorians, they were so uptight. Or the 1950s, they're so square, you know. Or the 1960s, have free love. But what about forward with sex? What's next? Where are we going? What's going to happen? Virtual reality? Is monogamy still going to be a thing? Are sex robots a thing? Are we going to see the end of long-distance relationships? What the heck is a teledildonic? <laughs> what is coming next in the world of human sexuality? And some of these things that I listed are yes, and some are probably not. Remember a little bit ago when we were talking about all those chemicals and brain regions and about how sex is actually good for you, it's healthy? Let me expand on that just a little bit with this sidebar. Vibrators. It wasn't actually invented as a sex pleasure toy, but a medical device. Super neat. And thinking about orgasms as a way to live longer and be less anxious and less stressed or depressed, how is a sex robot with, say, a vibrator built into it any different? Could you call that a medical device? I mean, it depends on your angle, right? Anyway, and sidebar. Sex robots are interesting, and they're talked about a lot. There's a lot of different versions of them in science fiction, and some of those have floated into science fact. Things like inflatable sex dolls, which are mostly used for comedy these days, but there are also lifelike sex dolls. Uh, they're not robots. They're really just posable mannequins. But the nice thing about sex robots is it helps people with social difficulties. You don't have to worry about performance issues or being able to find that exact spot, you know, that spot that maybe you can't find. Uh, you don't have to worry about whether you have a headache or not or whether you don't feel attractive or how your mood is. In Barcelona, they have what some would call a robot brothel. Silicone sex dolls are inside of the brothel. They're cleaned very often throughout the day. And they're not actually robots, but some in the media are calling it a robot brothel. Uh, but some doll makers, some people who do make these sex dolls, not the ones in the brothel, but a different doll maker, are working on adding AI to these sex dolls. And they want to put machines inside and make customizable personalities and have them talk to their owners. So imagine adding AI to that scenario something that can interact and talk back with you. For someone that might have social anxiety, that could be really beneficial to them. It could help them live a healthy life, have a healthy relationship in a safe space to then potentially go out and have a healthy relationship in a less safe space, like with an actual human. Maybe they never do that. Who are we to judge? In the meantime, technology is enabling relationships to sort of take baby steps into this future uh, in a purely digital sense, not so much in a physical machine robot sense. There's a pornography company that's working on VIRP, or virtual intercourse with real people. Essentially, they use virtual reality and vibrators, electronic male sex toys, an internet connection, sometimes with a webcam model, and the people don't even have to be in the same room, and yet they can still initiate sex or intercourse of some kind. Whether it's intercourse is actually a debate because you're not actually having intercourse. You're essentially doing mutual masturbation. Um, and this is part of a growing field called teledildonics, and it's technology for remote sexuality, remote mutual masturbation. And the name for sex robot research for all kinds is also teledildonics. So if you're interested in that, maybe Google it, probably not at work, just for safety. Uh, and if all of that sounds maybe too involved for you, there are other baby steps into this sex robot future with haptic technology. If you saw the movie Ready Player One, you saw haptic technology in action. And not real haptic technology, but this futuristic haptic technology. In reality, haptic technology interfaces with the user through a sense of touch. If you can imitate or simulate touch, 
then you are doing haptic technology. When your phone vibrates on keyboards as you type, that is haptic technology or haptics. Uh, and they're working on these things for full body immersion. The Tesla suit is one product where the full body haptic suit is worn on both male or female bodies. And you can create tiny electrical impulses in the fabric that can appear anywhere on the body. And it's built for gaming, but also for health and fitness. It can help you say, hey, this part of your body needs some work. This part of your body doesn't. Imagine if you were working out and you wanted to work out all of your different muscles. This type of suit could tell you, oh, this part of your body still needs some help. This part of your body has been overworked. This part of your body is overheated. Heated. You know, you can learn a lot about yourself using these feedback systems. Uh, and it's also built for virtual reality integration. There's even speculative technology like nanotechnology gel. It's tech that comes from robotics. It's useful for their joints. It's kind of like robotic cartilage almost. And if you put it on the body, you can use it to stimulate erogenous zones. So we're not to sex robots yet. The most advanced way to have sex with technology at this point is still in the realm of virtual reality, mutual masturbation, and so on and so forth. But we are damn close to sex robots. The fourth International Congress on Love and Sex with Robots is set for December of 2018. And topics include robot emotions, humanoid robots, clone robots, entertainment robots, robot personalities, teledildonics, intelligent electronic sex hardware, gender approaches, effective approaches, psychological approaches, sociological approaches, roboethics, and including philosophical approaches to all of these things with robot sex. They are not leaving any microchip unturned in this search for the future of sexuality. And VR is already used for pornography on a daily basis. Of the top five VR websites on the internet, three are pornography sites. I don't think I probably had to tell you that, but uh, it was an interesting analytic. So before we go though, if you're having sex with a robot, are you cheating on your partner? Does it matter? In the future, will it matter? Monogamy is a fascinating topic for all sex researchers. And it is related to the chemicals that go through your brain and the way that you react to sexuality. All of those things uh, do come back to monogamy and polyamory and polygamy and all of these other really complicated conversations. But will monogamy exist in the future is a consummate topic because many people feel like they want to predict the end of monogamy. People love to talk about, is monogamy over? Is monogamy canceled? Is this the end of monogamy? And is this such a horrible thing we're torturing ourselves with? Monogamy is complex and very individual slash couple slash more than a couple decision, but there is some science here. Four and a half-ish million years ago, there was Artipithecus ramidus, which is a predecessor of Homo sapien. And in Scientific American, they wrote, quote, females preferred reliable providers to aggressive competitors and thus bonded with the better foragers. Essentially, if you were good at getting resources, Arty would bond with you if you were also an Arty. So the two Arties would bond together into a pair so they would be stronger together. The key seems to be resources and competition when it comes to whether or not we are monogamous as a species. I don't personally have any belief there. I think there is a continuum of monogamy. Different couples and different relationships are going to be different. But most evolutionary biologists, anthropologists, and researchers do seem to agree that we were probably polygynous at some point. We had one male with many females. And some would argue that we still are. Less than 10% of species are monogamous, and primates are in the 15 to 29% range there. So we're more likely to be monogamous because we're primates. But as our brains evolved and grew, there were advantages to monogamy. Parental investment was needed from both parents, and males needed to be part of child rearing as it got more complicated to raise children that needed to be more intelligent, have more resources, making a baby took lots of time and training and education, and also needed protection from predators while it was doing that. So it helped primate males to stick around and defend babies, because if a primate male saw a baby that wasn't theirs, they would usually kill it or try to. Monogamy is more likely in species that are spread out as well. If you have a very widespread population, if they go for far distances for food or water, then you're more likely to be monogamous because you have that team. And this came from a couple of different studies, by the way, mainly done with primates. 
In other studies, though, STDs may have come into play as well. If there are hundreds of people and no condoms living in a small place in ancient humanity, diseases spread, which can kill or sterilize people, which then affects our ability to pass on our genes and affects our evolution, not to mention social factors. But none of this whole podcast has really been about the social factors around sex. It's just been about mechanical, molecular, and all sorts of other stuff. If you want to talk about social factors, that is a whole other field of study. And maybe we'll get into that someday, too. In the end, we are social animals. Sex is a social activity, and humanity is complicated. So even though sex is socially based, it is also built upon all of these little switches, molecular neurobiological clues and cues that we're getting, not to mention hormones and all of this other stuff. The brain and the body work with our social networks in specific locations, with relationships and the emotions. All of this, even technology, is all connected to our sexuality. In the future, sex is going to be a lot like sex now. It's going to be messy and complex and personal, and yet somehow governed by whatever norms are there in the society at the time and also what's available. And as always, when it comes to human sexuality, more research is needed. Thanks for watching this series on sex. I really hope you enjoyed it. If there's something that we missed that you wanted to talk about, let us know in the comments. Go over to Twitter and come find me. Talk to me about it. I'm at Trace Dominguez. We are at Seeker. Please subscribe for more episodes of all of our shows here on our channel. And thanks for watching again.